Hey there, welcome back to the channel and welcome to another video on first language acquisition. In this video, I'd like to discuss the question that you see here, who did what to whom? And at first glance, that doesn't seem to have a lot to do with language, right? So that seems like a question that you can ask about a detective novel where there's a murder and there are several suspects and you have to figure out who committed the murder and who's innocent and how it all happened, yeah? Now, let me explain. As a child, growing up, learning language, you actually have to do some serious detective work, yeah? So, when you hear longer utterances, utterances that describe processes or activities, typically those utterances contain several participants. And your task as a child is to match those participants, those parts of the utterance, with specific roles. Yeah? So within a given utterance, there might be an agent of an action, there could be an undergoer of an action, there could be an instrument with which the action is carried out, and a place where the action uh, happened. And, um, well, we can ask ourselves, how do children actually manage to figure out which part in an utterance belongs to which semantic role, okay? That's the question uh, for this video. And if you like, you can do a little exercise. Pause the video here and think for yourself just for five minutes or so. Take out a piece of paper. How do you think kids get this done? What kind of cues do they use as little detectives that figure out which roles uh, belong to which parts of the utterance? All right, I'm going to continue in three, two, one, zero. Sometimes the uh, detective work is actually quite easy. And that will be the case when you have a clear asymmetry between the participants. So one participant being alive, an animate being, yeah, capable of doing actions, and another participant being inanimate, not capable of doing anything, just there to endure whatever is done to them. So here we have a mouse and a cucumber, and guess what? The mouse is chopping the cucumber, and so um, here it is quite easy to assign the role of the agent to the mouse and the role of undergoer to the cucumber. Yeah? And uh, animate beings are just much more salient. Uh, children process animate beings cognitively in a different way than inanimate beings, and so on and so forth. So that would be a strong semantic cue with regard to how we assign roles in an utterance. Right, but of course there are also contexts where this is not so easy. Yeah. So imagine that you have a situation where there are several animate beings, and they're doing something to each other or something that is uh, what linguists call reciprocal, so that each uh, they're doing something to each other. So in this case here, the elephant and the mouse, they're looking at each other and there things get a lot, a lot more complicated. Yeah. So imagine that you're a child and maybe you have an idea of what the verb look at means. Yeah. Um, so if I were to describe the scene uh, with the words, the elephant, is looking at the mouse. Well, if you don't know the words elephant and mouse, you'll have a hard time deciding, okay, well, <clears throat> what does this first part refer to? What does this second part refer to? Um, because from the scene itself, uh, we don't have any semantic cues. So we have to rely on linguistic cues. Yeah? So what is there in the utterance? in terms of how the words are arranged, how the verbs are, how the words are marked with morphological affixes or uh, with determiners or any other cues. Yeah? So that is uh, the main topic for this video, really. How is language marking the different roles that we have in an utterance? Right. So, uh, what I have to say comes from Mike Tomasello's book, Constructing a Language. We're still in chapter 5, pages 122 to 144. And um, what I call, who did what to whom, Mike Tomasello calls uh, marking syntactic roles. Not quite as exciting, not quite as related to detective stories, but it means the same thing. So, here we go. Let me start by saying that language has essentially two jobs. <clears throat> uh, 
There are two things that every language on earth needs to accomplish and does accomplish. The first job is the one that ordinary people would usually associate with language, namely that language needs to provide words and expressions that refer to things, activities, qualities, and ideas. Yeah? So these words are what we would call content words or open class words. In English, nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. Those allow us to express ideas that we have and to communicate those ideas. However, there is an important second job that also every language on earth accomplishes, and that is that language needs to provide ways in which the relations between content words can be expressed. So, if we have several content items that we want to express and that build up to a larger idea, we need to arrange them in such a way that their mutual relations can be communicated to the person that we're talking to. And that is what grammar does. Okay, Grammar provides ways to express relations between content words. <clears throat> There are different strategies that languages take to uh, accomplish this goal. There is, of course, morphology. So adding inflectional morphological affixes to content words can clarify which roles we want to express, which relations we want to express. If you know a bit of German, German has case markers like nominative and uh, dative and accusative case. And those case markers, they actually tell you whether someone is the doer of an action or the undergoer of an action. There are also grammatical words, closed class words like prepositions or pronouns or determiners. Yeah, Also, they can show you whether something is the doer of an action or the undergoer of an action. So English, for example, marks uh, grammatical roles a lot with prepositions. When I say, I gave the book to Mary, yeah? so the preposition to marks Mary as the recipient of the book. And then finally, and that's a big topic for this video, there is word order. How we arrange the words in the utterance gives us important cues with regard to the roles of the different elements in an utterance. Which element comes first? Which element comes after the verb? Yeah. So these orderings are meaningful in English. Not in all languages, but in English and many other languages that I'm sure you know, word order is important and encodes these relations. Right. So in previous videos, we talked about uh, words, content words, and how children learn them, yeah? joint attention. Um, and um, that is hard enough. Yeah? But now imagine how children uh, figure out these ways in which relations between content words are expressed. That's not so easy. Yeah? So morphological affixes, they're small. They're hard to hear. Yeah? Uh, and sometimes it's not so easy to determine their meanings. So what does an accusative case suffix actually mean? Yeah? The meaning is relational. It's not very concrete. So all of these reasons are responsible for the fact that grammar comes in slowly. It comes in later than lexical words, which is what children start out with. Or think of word order. How do children acquire word order? Word order is a powerful cue, but it also is also a difficult cue because you have to look at the entire sentence to know the order of elements in that sentence. As an adult, you have accumulated a lot of knowledge on how syntactic relations are expressed in language. So for example, how do you tell subject from object or agent from patient in a sentence such as, it was John who Mary saw at the station? Well, who did Mary see at the station? You know, you understand that it's John. Yeah, so Mary saw John. But how is it that you know that when the sentence doesn't say Mary saw John? Yeah, so John is not in the usual object position uh, following the verb see. How do you know that? Yeah, you do know it, but how? Or how do we know which nominal belongs to which verb in a sentence such as John promised Mary to mow the lawn? Yeah. So who's supposed to mow the lawn? Again, you know it's John, but John is nowhere near the verb. 
So how is it that you understand this sentence correctly? Yeah. And then how do we know which nominal belongs to which pronoun when we have a possessive such as her in Susan asked Mary to feed her cat? Well, whose cat is it? Susan's cat? Mary's cat? Um, spoiler alert, the, the, the sentence is ambiguous, but people have preferences and they generally figure out whose damn cat it is. Yeah. All right. So um, you figure these things out with the help of linguistic cues that indicate who did what to whom, and children exploit these cues when they learn language. Yeah. So uh, there are several different types of cues. There is word order, of course. There are morphological markers. There is prosody, intonation. I haven't talked about that just yet, but we will get there. And uh, in the last part of this video, I will talk about how these cues are actually integrated and uh, what their relative importance is. So what cues children rely heavily on and what cues come in later during their linguistic development. All right, so let's go. Let's jump right in and start with word order. Um, I'm not telling you any uh, great secrets here. So the default word order in English is SVO, subject, verb, object. And this obviously applies to transitive verbs. When we have a transitive verb, we have the subject first, then the transitive verb, and then an object. And obviously this is a simplification. This doesn't capture the whole truth because many English verbs are in fact transitive and intransitive at the same time. So if you have a verb such as eat, we can use eat transitively and uh, say things like let's eat some pizza, but we can also say let's eat without any overt object following the verb eat. Same thing with uh, wipe, he wiped the floor, okay, that's transitive, he kept on wiping, that is uh, a transitive verb used intransitively. The chapter mentions a study that I want to talk about in a little bit of detail, namely Brooks and Tomasello, 1998. So their question for this study is, uh, do children generalize from intransitive verb usage to transitive verb usage? If children hear a verb being used intransitively, without an object, do they then generalize and use that same verb transitively, that is, with an object? The children who participated in the study were between two and three years old, and they were exposed to nonce verbs, verbs that are not real verbs of English, verbs like meeking and tamming that you've seen before. The experimenter in the training phase of the experiment used these verbs intransitively, so meeking without an object, um, tamming without an object. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> and the question then is, will the children use that same verb transitively in contexts that invite transitive usage, in contexts where there are two participants, one of them is alive, the other is inanimate, and the living participant acts on the inanimate participants. Things that would strongly remind us of transitive actions like cut and break and whatnot. Yeah? So let me uh, show you the prompts for this experiment. So here we have meeking, you've seen this before, so <clears throat> yeah. And uh, this kind of display would be accompanied by the experimenters saying things like, look, the banana is meeking. Yeah, so meeking, uh, without any mention of the fraggle who's responsible for the action, rather just with a focus on the banana in subject position, and then meeking as an intransitive verb. That's how the children were trained. Here's tamming, okay, we have the robot and the banana, and, uh, oh yeah, well, um, the banana is tamming. Okay, so that was the training phase of the experiment. And in the test phase of the experiment, the experimenter asked the children questions such as, what is the robot doing? Now, if I were to ask you that question, uh, you would be giving an answer such as, well, the robot is tamming the banana, yeah? So you would be using the verb tam in a transitive construction, despite the fact that you had only heard it used intransitively without an object. Yeah? We're so used to verbs that do both, 
that can be used transitively and intransitively, that you actually don't think twice about applying your knowledge about a new verb and uh, generalizing it from one type of construction to the other. But do the children do the same? The answer is no, they don't. Okay. In these two tables, you see data from the two-year-olds and from the 2.5-year-olds. And um, in these columns, you see how often the children responded with either an intransitive utterance or a transitive utterance. So the transitive one would be the one that would be expected uh, of an adult language user. And you see that many children actually never produce a transitive utterance. Yeah? Um, by contrast, most children actually produce an intransitive utterance. So they say things like, the banana is tamming. Yeah, because that is what they heard, and they are conservative with regard to how they're using the verb tan. I want to briefly mention another study with meeking and tamming that doesn't look so much at the production side of things, but rather at the comprehension side of things. So Brooks and Tomasello, if we go back for a minute, that is about what children are saying language production. This experiment is about what children are understanding, so their comprehension of word order. So the experiment was designed in such a way that in the training phase, the experimenter presented the actions and they said things like, this is called meeking. Now what's special about these utterances is that we have the verb meeking without any participants. Yeah, there's no object, there's no subject, it's just, this is called meeking. Yeah? And you and I would understand that, okay, if this is called meeking, then, okay, the fraggle is meeking the banana, the banana is getting meeked by the fraggle, and so on and so forth. Um, but do children understand that as well? Yeah? Just seeing the verb, do they understand that this verb has participants, and there's a doer and an undergoer and things like that? So this was tested in this experiment by presenting the actions first and then asking the children to reenact the activities. So the experimenter asked, okay, Tim, can you make the fraggle meek the banana? So uh, do children understand this? Do children understand that what they are being asked to do is just to reenact the activity? Do they understand what make the fraggle meek the banana actually means? <clears throat> Astonishingly, uh, younger children are not particularly good at this. So we have children who were two years and nine months old, and you know, they're quite proficient language users at that age, but their enactment of the activities was at chance level. Half the time they did everything right, half the time they, they, they just did something completely different. Whereas children at three years and eight months of age uh, had a perfect score of reenacting the activities involving the fraggle and the banana. Okay, so um, there are more studies that I could mention, but uh, just by way of a summary, Tomasello presents us with this curve that uh, summarizes results from different experiments <clears throat> where children are being asked to generalize from intransitive to transitive, and so on and so forth. And what we see is that there is a kind of S-curve where children don't perform particularly well until they're three years old. And then there's a rapid development between three and four years of age. And uh, by four and a half, this generalization across transitive and intransitive is very much complete. So children are not quite at ceiling, but at 80, 85, 90% accuracy. Okay, so that's when children produce transitive utterances with nonce verbs. Okay, some conclusions on word order. Until three years of age, English-speaking children don't really fully understand word order as a way of indicating who did what to whom. This SVO thing, they haven't figured out just yet. They use verbs conservatively. <clears throat> And even in contexts that are highly suggestive of transitive verb usage, yeah, where you have two participants and some kind of animacy asymmetry between them, um, that doesn't trigger SVO word order if that order hasn't been observed before, hasn't been trained before. 
Let's move on to morphological marking. And here I need to introduce a distinction that Tomasello makes in the chapter, namely the distinction between global cues and local cues. What are global cues and what are local cues? Well, word order is what we call a global cue. Global because the entire utterance, the entire sentence has to be taken into account to figure out who did what to whom. All the pieces need to be in place so that you can see them simultaneously. Yeah? Morphological affixes are different. There, it's enough to see one piece so that you know a bit about the entire picture. Those are called local cues. You have one place where there's a marker and that already gives you information. So an affix such as a case marker, a nominative case marker, an accusative case marker, uh, that kind of thing directly indicates whether the nominal that you're seeing is an agent or a patient. Okay, And because of that, local cues have a cognitive advantage. They're easier to process. So you don't have to hold a bunch of things in working memory in order to figure out a syntactic role. Rather, it's just a little piece of uh, linguistic substance at the end of a word that gives you that information. Right. Um, just to flesh this out with a concrete example, um, with regard to the distinction of global and local cues, Turkish would be a super child-friendly language because Turkish uses lots of morphological markers and um, they are typically postposed, syllabic and stressed, so they're easy to perceive. Uh, they are obligatory and with a one-to-one -one mapping of form to function, so one type of affix carries exactly one type of meaning and this means that they are predictable and they're bound to the noun rather than freestanding and that makes them good local cues. And lastly, they're regular across different uh, syntactic categories, so regular across nominals and pronominals. So that means that they are easily generalizable and if you make an abstraction, uh, that gives you a lot of information at once. Okay, English by comparison is not as child-friendly. Uh, if you take, for example, the present tense third-person singular s in he, she, it walks, well, uh, there's not just one meaning associated with that, but three, yeah? present tense, third-person, and singular. So, yeah, that's not so easy. That's a bit confusing. And what to make matters worse, the S actually looks exactly the same as the plural S in uh, one duck, two ducks, and so on and so forth. Right, so I want to talk about morphological markers and how children exploit them uh, in the context of another study. Uh, not on English, because English is morphologically relatively poor. So uh, here uh, Vitek and Tomasello turn to German which marks subject and object with different determiners. So we have sentences like uh, der Elefant umarmt den Hasen, uh, the elephant embraces the rabbit, and uh, der Hase umarmt den Elefant, that means the rabbit embraces the elephant. <clears throat> okay, so uh, another scenario where we have two animate agents who are basically both capable of carrying out an action and being the undergoer of an action. And the question that Vitek and Tomasello wanted to answer is this one here. Do German-speaking children generalize nominative and accusative determiners, so the der and den, uh, do they generalize these guys to novel masculine nouns? So instead of miking and tamming, we have doso, pebo, divu, and tomu, yeah, new nouns, in contexts like this one here. So this would be uh, der Fregel zieht den pebo. So this is the pebo. It's a garlic press. And uh, you see what's going on. Der Fregel zieht den pebo. <clears throat> so this would be training that uses the accusative case, the den determiner. Yeah. So the children in this experiment would see pebo in this kind of context where there's a subject, a verb, and then pebo in object position with the accusative determiner. Um, now, another group of children 
uh, would actually see stimuli like this one here, where you have the pebble all by itself and it's spinning. So in German, this would be der pebble dreht sich. <clears throat> and that would be the nominative training. Der pebble, well, der, that is nominative. It's in subject position. So that is how the second group of children would have been trained. Now, um, there are two conditions in the experiment, one with accusative training and nominative testing, and one where uh, these two categories are switched. That is, training happens with the nominative and testing happens in the accusative. So, one group of children would see scenarios like der Fregel zieht den Pebel, Pebel in the accusative, and then they would be tested in the nominative. Was ist das hier? To which the correct uh, answer would be, das ist der Pebel, or something like that. Yeah? Uh, opposite condition, nominative training, der Pebel dreht sich, and then the children would see the pulling scenario, so was macht der Fregel? Der Fregel zieht den Pebel. Okay, so do children generalize from one case to the other? And uh, is any of these conditions easier than the other? So is it easier to generalize from accusative to nominative? Or is it easier to generalize the other way around? That's what they wanted to find out. And um, well, uh, here are the results. Again, there are two groups, children who are two and a half years old and children who are three years old. And um, this would be the accusative training uh, nominative testing condition, and this would be the nominative training accusative testing uh, scenario. And you see that children are actually doing quite well in both conditions. So the um, <clears throat> uh, numbers in this column here are a bit higher. Yeah? So we have 0.83 for the younger children in the nominative target condition, and we have 1.21 uh, for the younger children in the accusative target condition. So even very young children easily generalize from nominative to accusative. <clears throat> Older children are a little bit better. Yeah, so you see the numbers increase, but not much, and it's not significant, so uh, there's that. <clears throat> but what that tells you is that uh, children, even at a very young age, figure out that these determiners are what linguists call paradigmatically related. So if you see one, you can be pretty sure that the same word can also be used with the other one in a different case, in a different syntactic role, yeah? whether it's the subject or the object. Right, so there are several studies in that paper and in another experiment, Vitek and Tomasella wanted to find out whether this kind of generalization also works in the same way with the dative case. So uh, here we have another scenario where the fraggle sits on top of the pebble. And for that kind of scenario, German uses the dative case. So dem pebble, that is a dative determiner that we have to use here. And uh, all the rest of the experiments stayed pretty much the same. So two conditions, one that had the training with the dative and then the testing with the nominative, <clears throat> and one where uh, the training was with the nominative and the testing was with the dative. So in the first condition, the children would see the frag, uh, der Fragel sitzt auf dem Pebel, and then they would get a question like, was ist denn das hier? Yeah, das ist der Pebel. And then uh, in the nominative training and dative testing condition, there would be, again, the spinning garlic press, der Pebo dreht sich, and then you would see the fraggle sitting on top of the garlic press and the question, what is that fraggle doing sitting on a garlic press? Yeah. Don't, don't get me started. Don't, yeah. Um, well, anyway, uh, do children generalize from one case to the other? And is it easier to generalize from, <coughs> sorry, from the dative to the nominative or the other way around? Here are the results, and they're a little bit different than um, what we saw earlier with nominative and accusative. So, um, <clears throat> generalizing from dative to nominative, that's in this condition, 
That is easy. Yeah. So if the child has seen a uh, an example where the dative determiner is used, they go ahead and generalize that to the nominative determiner and use that. But apparently, generalizing from nominative to dative is harder. Yeah. So the younger children don't do that particularly well, and also the older children don't all uh, produce that kind of language. Right, so in conclusion, morphological marking. Um, children who grow up with morphologically rich languages like Turkish uh, use those local cues from an early age onward. Morphological markers differ with regard to their learnability, how easily they are learned. And um, also within the same paradigm, there may be differences. So what we've seen in the uh, German experiment that accusative and nominative, they seem to be relatively easy, but dative, well, uh, not so much. Yeah? Generalizing from nominative to dative uh, didn't seem to be that easy. So, um, of course, generalizing from one marker to the other becomes easier with age, and eventually we all talk the same, right? So that's that. Let's move on to the third type of cue that we have, namely prosody. What is prosody? Prosody refers to the intonation of an utterance, the melody of an utterance. And intonation can have profound effects on how syntactic role assignment actually works. So when you have stress or emphasis, that can change the ordinary role assignment that we have. I'm giving you another example here from German. So when we have a sentence such as uh, this one, uh, die Maus ruft das Schaf an, this would mean um, the mouse, well, the, the mouse is calling up the sheep. So uh, what's interesting here is that uh, the mouse, this determiner, can be both nominative and accusative. They look the same, okay? Yeah, one of the many pitfalls uh, in learning German is figuring out, okay, when are the determiners different and when are they the same? And it's the same for uh, neuter nouns like sheep, okay? So das Schaf can be nominative or it can be accusative. So here, technically, the sentence is ambiguous. Yeah? It could be the mouse calling up the sheep or the sheep calling up the mouse. We don't know, but in the absence of any other cue, we go with word order and say that subject, well, that's the one that comes first, then the verb, and then the object. Yeah. So that's how you would understand the sentence by default. I can change that with prosody, with intonation. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, particularly when we have something like contrastive stress. So. Uh, imagine someone saying, nein, nicht den Elefanten. Die Maus ruft das Schaf an. Yeah? No, not the elephant. It's the mouse that the sheep is calling up. Yeah? Okay, so in this case, uh, intonation changes the ordinary default role assignment that we have. I'm coming to the last part of this video where I want to talk about how these different cues are integrated. Okay, so whenever you hear an utterance, you have to integrate the cues from word order, from morphological marking, from prosody, and from the context and any other semantic information that you have. So how do children figure out who did what to whom? What are the things that come into play? Uh, there are some things that are general, like semantic plausibility that don't necessarily have anything to do with language, but rather come from general world knowledge. So you know that animate beings can act and inanimate animate beings, well, not so much. So uh, it's more likely that an animate being gets assigned to the subject role and an inanimate being gets assigned to the object role. But then, of course, there are a bunch of linguistic structural cues like word order, uh, what comes first, what comes last in an utterance, morphological marking. So are there affixes, are there pronouns, are there determiners that indicate who did what to whom? And uh, there's also morphological agreement. So is a verb marked in such a way that it is clear who is doing the action? Yeah? So in many languages, <clears throat> the verb actually agrees in number or person with uh, the subject of a sentence. And then, as we've discussed, there is prosody.
All right, so all of these cues are used together in real time and they contribute to the um, role assignment that children uh, engage in. <clears throat> but how important are these cues, relatively speaking? There are lots of studies that have investigated the importance of these different types of cues and uh, the relative importance of these cues differs from language to language because the languages are structured in different ways. So I would like you to pause the video for a minute and just take a look at this table where Tomasello contrasts languages such as English, Italian, French, Dutch, Serbo-Croatian, Hungarian, and Turkish. And you can check out for yourself which cues are more important than others in these respective languages. Okay, so if you do that now, press pause and I will continue now. So what we're seeing is that in English, for instance, word order is a very important cue, yeah? followed by uh, animacy, so that is a semantic consideration, followed by agreement, how a verb and a subject uh, agree in number and person, and then there's stress. There's a little change from very young children to adults, but overall the uh, importance of word order and semantics is shared across uh, children and adults. This is not the case for all languages. So for example, we talked about Turkish earlier and how Turkish encodes lots of information via morphology. So for Turkish, case is a cue that is a lot more important than word order. Okay, <clears throat> animacy also comes into play, but for languages that have morphology, or let's say lots of morphology, for those languages, case generally is more important than word order, uh, symbolized here either as word order or SVO or, or um, <coughs> SV and so on and so forth. Let me finish this video by saying a few general things about the time course of learning syntax. What have we learned up to this point about how children acquire syntax? It all starts with elements that don't look much like syntax at all, namely uh, with what we called hollow phrases, okay? Things like thank you or give me that. So those are utterances that from the adult perspective look like uh, elements with several parts. Yeah, but from the child's perspective, these are actually holistic units. They don't have parts, they are just strings of sounds that belong together that form a unit. Um, and it's only later at the second stage that children begin to understand that syntax allows you to combine different things in a flexible kind of way. So those are the pivot schemas that we talked about, combinations of a fixed part with an open slot where you can fit in several different uh, words. So more milk, more juice, more cookie, and so on and so forth, or let's dance, let's eat, let's go, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's where children understand that syntax is actually uh, a tool that allows you to use language more or less creatively. This continues with item-based constructions. So item-based constructions would be the uh, kind of construction where you have a verb that combines with one or more different participants. So for example, give with a pronoun uh, and a noun. So give me the juice or give him the doggy. Yeah? So as soon as a child is able to understand that, okay, there's give, you can uh, combine it with a pronoun and some kind of noun. You see it's a logical extension of the pivot schemas, except it's a bit more flexible, it's a bit more general. Yeah? The verb can take different shapes, the pronoun can take different shapes, the noun can take different shapes, and you can extend the item-based construction from give to other verbs, so like throw or send or uh, pass and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, and from that 
we go on to abstract constructions like the transitive construction, which essentially boils it down to subject, verb, object, word, order in English. And uh, as we've discussed, that takes quite a bit. Yeah. So hollow phrases, they emerge around the first birthday. Um, pivot schemas we have six months later, give or take. Uh, further six months later, we get these item-based construction. And then it takes another year or so before we have abstract word order uh, understood by the child. Right, so this is a long journey, learning syntax, and um, <clears throat> I hope to have given you some idea of how the process uh, works. So for next time, please read uh, pages 144 to 161 in Thomas Ellis' book, and do the online quiz uh, number seven that goes along with it. Until then, have a good week. I'll see you next time.